Greetings in this Pentecost season. Greetings in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. On this Sunday in which we study Proper 21, Luke 16, 19 to 31, The Rich Man and Lazarus. As you know, um, when I have been uh, recording these podcasts before, I spent a lot of time this year talking to pastors in pastoral conferences and in a course with uh, DMIN students at St. Louis about the Luke Pentecost Gospels. And I tried to organize them in terms of sermon series. And we have the beginning of another sermon series here with the rich man and Lazarus. I would like to point out, however, that we are coming now to the end of a section of Luke's Gospel in which Jesus has been teaching primarily in parables, and this is the Luke parabolic section. So what we have here in proper 21 and 22, and I'll be doing proper 22 with you, we have the the first two of what I think are a three-part sermon series that really could be very um, kind of unified in their teachings if you think about it carefully, and that's what I want to do with you today. Um, The rich man and Lazarus, we're going to see that, for my money, the most important theme is Moses and the prophets. And it is, in Luke's Gospel, one of the the passages that is part of his matrix of the proper use of possessions. Boy, I didn't, but the proper use of possessions. And, I mean, here you can really see sort of the eschatological consequences of that. But in a way, it is about whether or not the rich man has shown mercy. And so mercy is going to be a theme that is going to go all the way through these three texts. Uh, In the text that we're going to do in a moment on Jesus' teachings on discipleship, it's it's a varied text. But again, mercy and forgiveness are at the heart of this text. And I think we're going to see that the Office of the Holy Ministry is very much involved here. And in a way, this is sort of, at least in this little series, the central text. The, um, the healing mercy of Jesus here with the, the, um, the ten lepers, uh, here it, it's the locale of God's presence, his healing presence, and it's in Jesus. And in a way, this kind of relates as to whether or not people understand the nature of Moses and the prophets. Um, I I would like to see you kind of toy with this a little bit and kind of work with this so that you can, in a sense, present perhaps in these three texts um, a a unified theme. It it is interesting, though, that this does start a new section. And, of course, we're going to see that there is, in the beginning of this text, the final uh, pa- uh, excuse me, the final travel notice. So, so there is a little bit of a shift there. But anyway, that, that's how I wanted to start. Uh, the next thing I want to do is look a little bit at the structure. As you know, I'm very interested in those things. And here I have in the English, and this is right out of the commentary, some things that I think will be helpful in terms of, of just getting a, a, a vision of the whole thing. You can see I've divided it into three sections. The first section here is a beautiful little chiasm that tells the story of of the rich man and Lazarus. And the rich man is in the outer circle here, okay? And then the the poor man, Lazarus, is in the the next circle. And then you you can see here that what happens to Lazarus is in the center that he longs to be satisfied with the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table and the dogs lick, you know, coming and licking his sores. Now, this, I think, very much is an echo of the Magnificat. And what I mean by that is magnif- Magnificat. There we go. The Magnificat. And what I mean by that is you have this, this idea that the kingdom is for those who are at, you know, the most destitute, at the height of poverty. I love the Spanish word, desamparado. 
which means the dispossessed, the, the, the complete outcasts. And Lazarus certainly is that. And, um, and you, can, you can see how, you know, the way in which Luke shapes this, you know, the most important part is the middle part. And the middle part, of course, is all about Lazarus. So it, here, I'll put it in red here. Th this really, this whole section, the bees and the seas are about Lazarus. And, you know, <laughs> you, you get the first indication of Abraham here, the bosom of Abraham. And there's going to be then in the second part that conversation between the rich man and Lazarus, which is what the, the rest of the pericope is about. And then you can see here that it's divided into two sections. The first part is, you know, you see this Lazarus who's in the middle of the, of the, the, the chiasm here in the, the story that's told. He's in the heavenly places, whereas the rich man is suffering this incredible torment, and it's suffering torment. And then the last part is where I think that the most important part of the text is um, one has to hear first Moses and the prophets, and then, of course, even one who's raised from the dead, I think, is a, is a reference to Jesus. And I'm going to accent when we get there, but I'll say it now. This has to do with Emmaus. I mean, Emmaus here is in, in view. So I think it's very important to recognize that. Anyway, th there's an overall structure. And you know, on many levels, I, you know, I always have taught that you could use the structure of the text to kind of tell the story of the sermon and use that as the structure of your sermon. And this one really does work. Here's part one, tell the story. Part two, tell about how the story realizes itself in the heavenly places. And then part three is really where you're, you know, in a sense, you're your, not, not just your main point, but where the gospel really comes in gangbusters. What do Moses and the prophets testify to? And that's the key. So anyway, um, that's, an, that's an overview of the text. Let's now look at, you know, the, the, the Greek itself and just highlight a few things here that I, I think really do, you know, prove that these themes are very much what is involved here. Now, if you look carefully here, it's, it's here where we have the break. This is where the story is told. And in the Greek here, you can see the language that is used. Um, the, 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 the language here of, of richness, okay? And you can see that... Um, here at the end, rich. So there's, there's where you can see how the, the chiasm comes up. Um, here is his poverty. And again, you see his poverty here. Um, and he gets a name, Lazarus, which certainly puts us in mind of baptism, that this is a person who is um, known by God because he has been uh, named with God's name, so to speak. Now, you know that tradition says that the rich man was called Dives, but we don't, we don't have that here. We, we don't know. He's just the rich man. And um, <clears throat> this language here, this epithumia, to be satisfied. Now, this is clearly an echo of Luke 6. You know, blessed are you who hunger now, because you will be satisfied. And it's also a, an echo of Luke 9, where at the end of the feeding of the 5,000, everybody is sat, sat, satisfied. There's an abundance, 12 baskets of leftovers. So, I mean, here is the, kind of the height of his poverty, but then we see that he does inherit, you know, the kingdom, and there's the first use of Abraham, in the bosom of Abraham. Uh, it, it's, it's a classic story. It's a story that is well known to people, so it's not something that will be unfamiliar to them. But oftentimes, I think it isn't always interpreted in such a way that it, it does bring out 
the, the most important points. Now, when we actually get to the text uh, itself, that is, in a sense, the, um, the way in which the story unfolds in heaven, we can see that, that we're dealing with this part here, 23 to 26, first of all. And this is the conversation, of course, between the rich man and Lazarus, in which the heavenly life of Lazarus is compared with the eternal torment of the rich man. Um, I, I didn't put this in yellow, but here's Abraham again. Abraham, look at how, how important Abraham is here. Um, the name of Abraham, which of course is hinted in the beginning, um, Abraham is the representative of, of, of heaven, and it's his bosom into which we, we rest. And he is, in a sense, our father. Down here, he's just going to be called father. And the, 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 the key to me in, in this whole thing that really does say uh, what this text is about is this part here in the yellow where... He says, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Now, there is, I think, the key theme of these three pericopes in this little sermon series. How does God show mercy? And the way in which we're going to see in this text that God shows mercy is that he has given us Moses, the prophets, and Jesus the fulfillment of them, who shows that in his resurrected body. Now that, to me, is the real key of this section. And of course, one of the things that Abraham does in his response is he calls the rich man to remember. Now this is, this is that word, you know, um, do this in remembrance of me, that sense of a nam -nesis. You know, remember me when you come into your kingdom, the, the thief on the cross says. And, and he is telling him to go back and to remember. And, and this is where you can see how the narrative is so important. The rich man had his narrative. It was what we heard in the first verses and the narrative of his his opulent life his lack of mercy his lack of sharing alms his lack of reaching out to somebody like Lazarus and that he was this pathetic person who wouldn't even eat the cr didn't even have the crumbs to eat from the table the door the dogs licked his sores you know that was his narrative and he's telling him to remember that and that, that anamnesis is going to put us in line of, of what it is that we are to remember. And that is to remember Moses and the prophets. That is the key to understanding this text. That if you don't remember that, you're going to end up like the rich man. And one of the subtexts here, or maybe not so subtext, it's a, it's a really important theme in Luke is the theme of almsgiving. I, I, I would preach on that when, you know, you in the middle of Luke here with all these texts. Because, I mean, that as some of you know, that's mercy giving, almsgiving. That's mercy giving. And that is what this man is guilty of not doing. He does not use the things that he has been given for mercy. And that certainly was the theme of the rich fool in Luke 10. It was the theme, I think, of the unjust steward, you know, although I think the unjust steward actually does depend on a merciful master. This was last week's text, on a merciful master, and therefore he does operate in the context of mercy. But the, uh, the, the situation here for this man is, is brutal, and of course the situation for Lazarus is one in which he is you know, receiving, you know, the, 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 in a sense, what those who hunger and thirst for righteousness receive. You know, he, he has it fulfilled in the kingdom of heaven. Now that brings us to the last part here. 
what I, as I said before, consider to be the, the, the real point of this parable, the denouement, in verses 27 to 31, this part here. And I, I love the way in which the, the text flows out. You know, he starts by calling him father, and then he calls him father Abraham. And of course, Abraham is the one who speaks in here. And it's Abraham, it is Abraham who talks about Moses and the prophets. Listen to them. Now that's, that's, a, a, that's a, an echo of Deuteronomy 18. You know, that, you know, listen to Moses and the prophets. And notice the language here, you know, um, uh, the, of, the, of the, ri the uh, rich man. He does use the language of repentance. So you do get a sense that, you know, he has, he has part of it, but he does not get the whole thing. And again, this, look at how this is repeated here. There's a little frame here. Moses and the prophets, they do not listen. You know, here they listen, but they do not listen. So therefore, there will be, you know, no forgiveness because there's no possibility of repentance for those who do not hear Moses and the prophets. Now, I mean, you could, you could preach this as law, but I think what you need to do is flip it in the sense that, that you look out at the people of God and you say, you are sitting there and you are listening to Moses and the prophets. And your hearts are cut to the quick, like in, in Acts 2 in Pentecost, you do repent of your sins. And so right now, you are joining Lazarus by coming to the table here and by receiving here, you know, just to, to quote, you know, a phrase, heaven on earth in the Eucharist. I, I think that, that, that's why Emmaus is so important here. Because it is in the breaking of the bread that is prepared for by Moses and the prophets that one joins Lazarus in the heavenly feast. And I do think that, you know, but even if someone rises from the dead, you know, um, uh, that, that, uh, that, you know, they, will they be persuaded? Not even if someone rises from the dead, will they be persuaded? I do think this is, of course, a reference to Christ. And it does exactly what the prodigal son in Luke 15 does. You know, these lover of monies, these Pharisees that we heard of last week, will they listen to their own Moses and the prophets? And when Jesus rises from the dead, you know, and he opens up Moses and the prophets on the road to the Emmaus, will they be like the Emmaus disciples whose eyes are open in the breaking of the bread? Again, it, it ends up being sort of a negative you know, kind of conclusion there. Um, and it, it could be perceived as being something that is fully and completely kind of a, an, an ending of law. But I, I think that what, what we can do now is we can take this and we can, as I said before, we can, we can talk about how it is that we have been given the gift of Moses and the prophets. We've been given open eyes in the breaking of the bread that the risen one does come to us every, in, in every divine service, and that we are, in a sense, persuaded about what it is that we have become in Christ and what we now do in Christ and how we live in Christ and all the things that we've been given in Christ, and that the, the heart of what it is that we have done is that we have been shown mercy.